We've got a whole bunch of different people, and some of them I'll call out. We've got Philip Carter, we've got Chet Husk. Chet, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself and who you are and what you do with the F-Sharp software? Are you still actually on the board? I've forgotten. Uh, um, no, I, I took okay. a leave of absence from you the board. Okay, but yeah. explain what you did on the board and your involvement in the F-Sharp community uh, compiler side of things. Would you like to do that just for a moment? Sure. Um, okay. Let's see, I was, I was on the board for a few years, and by the board, I mean the board of the F-Sharp uh, Software Foundation, the open source entity that uh, partially controls and guides and directs um, a lot of sort of the community-owned resources of the language. Um, we focused, during my tenure, we focused a lot on sort of community activities like sponsorship programs for speakers to uh, meetup groups. Um, we had the mentorship program, which is an ongoing and still very, uh, I guess, community profitable uh, program. And uh, we sponsored various conferences and tickets to those and that sort of thing. Um, they also host the, uh, the Slack that some folks uh, here may be familiar with. Um, my involvement with FCS, which is the component we'll be talking about today, is for a while I was sort of the co-janitor of it. Um, for a long time, it was published as a separate standalone component from the uh, compiler and f -sharp core library. And um, part of the process of publishing that was just migrating commits across repos, um, ensuring things were kept up to date, ensuring documentation was in place, and that sort of thing. So I, I moved bits around and made sure they got published the right way. That's right. And now I use it as one of the co-maintainers of F Sharp Autocomplete, the editor service powering I and I and I and I them. That's right. And uh, so first of all, I think as a community chat, we want to give you a huge call out and a huge thank you for all the work you've done on the F Sharp compiler service over the last few years. You have been an amazing contributor. And I think last, I, I, I you know, it's a bit of a backlog on the F-Sharp Community Hero Awards. Uh, I'm not sure you collected one of those in previous years, but I'm sure when we when we all get the chance to run Open F-Sharp again, uh, we'll be lining you up for your for your mug. I don't know if people know, but there are there's a long tradition in the F-Sharp community of uh, giving out a Community Hero Awards at the Open F-Sharp conference, usually in San Francisco. Uh, of course, that conference didn't happen in person in 2020, and since we're still in 2020, we can't be confident it's going to happen this year uh, at all, uh, it seems. So we're stuck in uh, 2020 for a bit longer, it seems. And um, so, uh, yeah, so hopefully the community for F-Sharp uh, uh, We'll, we'll we'll look after um, we'll look after that at some point. But anyway, a huge thank you for everything you've been doing. Uh, I, I'll give you a bit of a history of the F# -sharp compiler service component. Uh, I'll share my screen. Um, I've got I'm, I'm going to get the dates wrong, and I'm and I'm, I'm probably also going to forget uh, things along the way. So F# -sharp compiler F# -sharp dot compiler the service is here are the docs for it here f sharp compiler service so this thing actually started off with an effort by uh really by thomas petracek and when we first did the uh visual f sharp tools for to, as for the ide tools inside uh visual studio we sort of had a notion of there being this thing which was a compiler service, which would, which was the language service, which was used while editing. And then when we did, uh, but it wasn't a separate component. It was just a kind of private DLL component inside um, the, the F Sharp 2.0 implementation. And then we open sourced uh, F Sharp at the same time uh, and uh, in 2010, 2011. And uh, Thomas Petracek went and, you know, he wanted to be able to use F Sharp. Uh, he, he's, he just kind of was very early, very active early on in engineering around F Sharp. And he carved out these editor services as a component and a project on GitHub very early on. And then as we started to sort of expand out the use of F sharp there was a lot of interest in using F sharp in in note in sort of a notebook kind of form uh, right in terms of Jupyter notebooks and uh, before that we various people a, a person called Matthew Maloney 
uh, created a thing called Tsunami, which was a set of editing tools for F Sharp, uh, and they were based in, uh, they were web delivered based, I think it was the Silverlight was the front end of that. And he had the whole vision of sort of doing data science from the browser using F Sharp with rich F Sharp, strong typing while connecting to various back, big data backend services, the sort of thing that people do a lot with uh, Jupyter note Notebooks today. And uh, he, uh, that was around 2013, 2014, he did uh, some iterations on that work privately. He did some iterations uh, in the, was under contract from Microsoft. And uh, he also participated in a thing called f -Cell, which was to embed F-sharp in Excel, a little bit like Excel DNA today, but with very, very tight integration between F-sharp and Excel. And that also used, uh, uh, sort of needed a whole set of compiler services under the hood. And so uh, while working with Matt and working with someone called John Harrop, who was looking at making F-sharp notebook support, you know, it just became entirely obvious that we needed a component which just contained all the goodness of the compiler, allowed you to do everything, allowed you to execute, allowed you to analyze, allowed you to, to uh, tokenize your code, uh, just do absolutely everything. Um, and that finally crystallized partly through Thomas's project and then iterating on it, and I think in about 2014 or so, the very first, uh, 2015, the very first editions of F Sharp Compiler Service .dll rolled off the uh, off the presses. And um, now, for uh, F, F Sharp engineer, F Sharp was open source, but the engineering associated with F Sharp was not open engineering. It was sort of being still being done via a code drop model. And so there was a very painful period, period, I think, from about 2014 to 2017, really, or 2013 to 2016, where we uh, where, yeah, we had to kind of do everything manually in a way. We had to kind of keep try and keep everything aligned between the Microsoft versions of F Sharp, this ones that were on Codeplex and other places. And then we had effectively three different places where the compiler code lived and a, and a fairly complex relationship between those. It was a painful period uh, for F Sharp engineering, but it, but we we knew how important it was to have an open source component which uh, power was sort of used in a lot of things. Now this, uh, this, this list actually you can see in front of you is actually old uh, because these docs are a little bit old, but they date from, uh, I'm not sure what, 2000 and so 16 or 17. And you can see the sort of thing back then that people were doing. There was a set of additional tools to Visual Studio uh, called Visual F Sharp Power Tools. And uh, nearly, that was, they were open source. Um, uh, they, they were done by a wonderful collection of contributors from all, the, all, all, all very, totally community based and a really incredibly good set of additional tools to use. They use the F Sharp compiler service under the hood. Uh, Xamarin was built on it, Emacs, Vim, all the editing tools, JetBrains. Writer started to uh, support a prob probably 2017 or 18, I'm not sure when, uh, and they started to build on this component, which really stress tests it. Tests this. This is actually when I first interacted with people from JetBrains, they they more or less said to me, "We are never going to use your parser. We're never going to use your type checker." You know, when we do stuff at JetBrains, and they are obviously very, very good at this side of, of, of tooling support for programming languages, and I can understand why they had that uh, approach. Uh, but uh, I also knew that they would never really be able to afford to, to double implement F Sharp, uh, as, as I think they did for Scala or uh, and Java and so on, and C Sharp. So uh, they, um, in the end, when I saw JetBrains come on and build on this component for a what is effectively a commercial product, I sort of knew that the component was going to stand the test of time uh, in terms of how it was structured, how it was delivered, and so on. And 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 they, of course, JetBrains are Eugene or or Dinichuk from. JetBrains is a uh, is a wonderful contributor to the compiler service components. 
Uh, okay, the Jupyter Notebook support uh, one the first iteration and the second iteration also uses the same component. You can see that people have used the F-Sharp compiler service to integrate F-Sharp editing and programming into gaming, sort of game scripting experiences. So you can kind of code, uh, and also Excel is this sort of thing. Excel is just sort of a big, a big game in a way. Uh, and you can, uh, FCL is listed here. I think actually FCL is no longer around as a thing, but uh, you could put Microsoft into, put F sharp into Excel. And then analysis tools. And is this still around? FS reveal lets you create slides and I'll put some examples around here. Oh, no. Okay. Well, anyway, you, 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 these are old links largely, but you get to create, um, uh, turn Markdown into, um, so it's used for document processing. So you write the Markdown of F-sharp script files and you generate some slides in a particular format. And uh, it's used in the documentation tools for F-sharp, which we've talked about in previous sessions, F-sharp dot formatting. And, uh, and then uh, I think this is a set of code analysis tools, if I've got that right, um, for, for, for Farnet. And there are many other uses of it uh, which you can track down on GitHub if you like. Okay, so uh, let me, let's start to break down what is in the compiler service. And I will, first of all, take Questions just to finish off the history. No, just to finish off the history. Just in the last six months, we have taken the engineering uh, for um, the F# -sharp compiler service. It used to be done on GitHub.com/slash F# -sharp, uh, F -sharp compiler service in this repo here. Though uh, this repo is now mostly read only, and it's, and in fact nearly all the engineering is now done through .NET F Sharp. I don't know if people remembered, but about uh, four, three or four years ago, we started talking about the grand unification between these three strands of engineering between the mono version of F Sharp, which was, uh, which, or these, yeah, the mono, the, the F Sharp and the F Sharp compiler service repository and the visual F Sharp repository. And we are finally there we have sort of unified everything into .NET F Sharp, and um, yeah, it's really, really fa fantastic to have finally reach that grand unification. We actually thought it would be impossible to ever get there, but we did. We did make it. Uh, right. So uh, let's talk uh, about. Let's talk. So to talk about the various parts of the FDR compiler service, I will just check questions first of all, and we'll also just say hi to a few people just to check. We've got Scott Nimrod on the call. Hello, great to have you along, Govert. Uh, I think I don't recognize your name. Maybe you're on a previous call, but great to have you along again. Uh, Nick, uh, Nick is here. Uh, good to have someone from G Research here. Wonderful to have you along. Gustavo, hi. And uh, Sergey. Good to have you, Luis, uh, Luis Ferraro. Soren is here. Great to have you along. And Scott Hutchinson. Cool. Good to good to have you here. And I think I said hi to everyone else uh, a little bit earlier on in the call. Let's check the conversation. Feel free to drop uh, questions in. Uh, no questions so far. Uh, and Vlad, I know you will have come prepared with uh, many questions to ask along the way. Do you have any so far? You... No, not yet. Let's uh, let let let's uh, let's move on, and I, I I will have a bunch. Okay, wonderful. Uh, okay, now I'm only just back to work for the first time uh, since the Christmas break. I hope everybody took a really good holiday over the holiday break. If your if your culture is is, is, is taking holidays at this time, for me. I know I needed it, so make sure you all take a, a really proper break. Um, and if you haven't done it so far, but look after yourself this year. It's been a pretty rough time for everyone, so please make sure you do that. I know I, I was very glad to take a few weeks off where I just didn't think about F-sharp, didn't think about anything for like two weeks. 
So uh, forgive me if it's taking me a little while to get back into the swing of this. Uh, what I do want to mention is some things that happened before uh, uh, before Christmas uh, in the engineering of the compiler. Uh, and one of those is we've done really, really a lot of cleanups. Let me just pull up my, my pull request. So pull slash design. And here we'll look at the closed ones. OK, and uh, one of the things we did was to actually add a huge number of signature files to the compiler. OK, and uh, if we come across to the compiler, you'll see that nearly everything here now actually has a signature file across the pretty much the entire compiler. Now, this is not something we've talked about much publicly, but the visual, uh, the, 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 the F-sharp editing tools actually have a new feature in a way, which is if you actually use signature files, then the analysis of your project as, as you change things, as you work in your project, will actually be much, much faster than it was before. And in particular, if I, for instance, come to a signature file here and I make a change in uh, this file and then I, um, I uh, then it doesn't go through and recheck everything all the way down. It will um, uh, it will sort of use the signature files. It doesn't go through and check the implementations unless you're actually kind of needed. Uh, and, and Will has been working on that feature. And it does mean that working in the F# -sharp compiler has become way faster in, when using uh, the Visual Visual Studio tools. Uh, so, really, things are getting better and better when working on the F# -sharp compiler code base. Uh, so that's one reason why we added the signature files because it actually improves performance, but it also provides good encapsulation and documentation right across the compiler. Uh, the compiler code base. We've also done a lot of splitting out things into smaller chunks. It used to be that this FS, uh, this thing that dr drives the compiler in the command line mode uh, was just one file. And actually, it, we've split it out into these various sections that you can see here. You can see the XML doc file writer. These are just nice, simple, you know, 100 line long sort of things. Hey Don, you... sorry to sorry to interrupt. Um, I don't think yeah. we see your your Visual Studio. Ah, uh, I see. I, I okay, okay. Yes, I wasn't. Did I share the wrong thing? Oh, okay. Share desktop. Share the window. Is that better? Uh, yes. Got it. Okay, so I was just pointing to the various signature files along here. Okay, so we have this fsc.fs, which was the driver for the whole compiler. The uh, and contained a lot of backend stuff for the compiler. And we have split this out to like creating the IO module, static linking in other modules, uh, some things to do with writing binary resources in binaries, and uh, the part to write up the XML doc file. And you can see here that it's something like the XML doc file writer, which used to be hidden away inside a 5,000 line file, is now just a nice little 100 line separate thing with a nice little signature file on it. Uh, they, these, these should have comments on it, but you, you can pretty much guess what they do. From uh, from these elements here, from their type signatures, and um, okay, so that that's become much nicer. And the other parts of the compiler, some previous work that was done, where we split out the type checker, which used to be a like twenty thousand line behemoth, and that's been split at least into two parts, uh, three parts actually: checking expressions, checking computation expressions, and checking declarations. Uh, and they're still, they're still long, long files, but there are at least uh, some splitting going up there. And we've also split out some other parts of the compiler to do with the sort of the configuration of the compiler here with TC config here and importing various assemblies and then emitting diagnostics, parsing and checking all inputs. Uh, if we're processing scripts, then we compute the closure of all the script files, all the hash loads in the script files and all the hash R's and all the, so you can actually see them here, all the source files referenced by a script, all the references, 
all the package references uh, for, for the NuGet packages and uh, so on, the things that we extract from the analysis of the script before we even start to check, check, start the type check it, start to analyze it. Okay, uh, so that's all become much healthier and way easier to work in the compiler, uh, I think. I've been, I, I, I've been really enjoying it much more. Okay, so what we really want to look at is everything that comes after fsc.fs, which are all these files here, really up down to here, really correspond to the layer, which is the F Sharp compiler service API. And it is, uh, let's just run through the elements of the API as we in the, the docs here and then map them down to what they are. So there's an F sharp language tokenizer. Okay, so that will roughly that will be in uh, not where is it service lexing here. And the key entry point which we will look at is down. Uh, is it this one? It, I think this one is usually used. Uh, you create an F sharp source tokenizer. You give it uh, a file name that, and then you, for each for the source, you can create a line tokenizer here, or you can create it by filling a buffer. But I don't think people that's really used anymore. So we create a line tokenizer, and then once you have a line tokenizer, you get to call scan token again and again, and that gives you uh, a, a, an optional token info. And you and you pass this state through that represents this of incremental state of the tokenization. So that's it's a very simple entry point into the F# -sharp compiler service. You can kind of uh, we looked at tokenizing a few weeks ago, and you it uses the same code as, uh, that we were using looking at internally, and uh, you can come along to the documentation. Where is that? Should be here. Docs documentation is at the bottom. Docs, docs, docs was here, is it? Okay, maybe it doesn't matter. And open it directly. And you can come along and look at the docs, and you can come to FCS, and you can look at tokenizer here. And this is set up so that if you're if we're doing things correctly, Okay, we have F sharp interactive here, and we reference that path, and we reference the DLL, and we open some namespaces. We create one of those source tokenizers. We create a li line tokenizer, and this is a recursive, a recursive function just to sit in the loop, uh, calling that tokenizer again and again, and printing out the tokens here, and we can tokenize a line here. So this is tokenizing. Uh, check. Oh, yes, there's the code that we just tokenized. And you can see let white space ident equals in 32. And then there's a tokenizer state, which is a compact bit of two 64 bit numbers, uh, which can is a sort of encoded compact form for the continuation of the tokenizer to allow you to do incremental tokenization line by line and only keep the minimal amount of information necessary to, to restart that tokenization uh, at, at the end of the last line of the visual editor. OK, so already we've got something useful from the F-sharp compiler service in that you can actually build a colorizer based on this. Uh, there's actually there's some other things that this the the documentation here tokenizer.fsx runs through uh, things about colorization. It mentions up here char class, color class, and so on. Uh, this is a fairly this is one of the original parts of the F# -sharp compiler service, and it is worth uh, checking out the. Uh, Sometimes the layers that consume this tokenizer have actually 
expanded out the information that uh, the, the the kind of the colorization information that's available for tokens, and they've done other things to to get better color colorization based on other analysis. Uh, this is just based purely on the syntax. Uh, so, but there's also colorizations based on type checking. So there's sort of extra information gets folded in. Okay, so that's the first part of the compiler service. Um, so the, the the next part is to just to do with what information you can get from parsing a uh, a file without doing any analysis of the file, but just to do what we call the untyped or uh, the syntax tree of the file. And so if we go to uh, the part of the code base that, that corresponds to, first of all, it it comes in through service.fsi. So many of the things you can do with the compiler service come in via an F sharp checker object here. And you create an F sharp checker object, and it's got a whole bunch of uh, optional arguments uh, to which you can read about here and their parameter help there. And once you create it, you can use an F sharp checker for various things. And the reason why we have an object here is because it does associate with some uh, ca caches, and uh, and there and all these flags obviously apply to any of the, op the operations you perform. And so, um, okay. So one of the things you can do is parse a file. And once you parse a file, you get your F sharp parse file results. And uh, this thing will include a, if the parse didn't catastrophically fail, or if, if, if we got some kind of AST back, this will be populated for the syntax tree. This is the um, untyped syntax tree. And then when you can also sort of investigate that syntax tree for a bunch of different operations here. You can, um, uh, these are somewhat ad hoc operations of just read through the documentation of all the different things you can kind of do. Uh, this is used to support a, an IDE feature, uh, for instance, that when you are working in a file and you press uh, sort of comma at a position like this, then this, because you're at position uh, two, argument number two, it might show particular help, not in that particular case, but I'll find another example of this, I think. Uh, let's choose. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, okay, so in the case, it's, for instance, if you're at the third, uh, third, there we go. It's we're at the third uh, argument position, so it's highlighting the third argument of the uh, method call. And so the analysis that is happening there is you you do the parsing, you then say the cursor is at a particular position, and you're saying give me a whole bunch of information. That, so that's where that so that's where the actual cursor is at as in like this particular position it's at line 90 character 50 and you say tell me uh, about the uh tell me what give me information about which parameter position we're at and uh is the various other things that are going on with the, the at that particular location okay you can also find out whether your paths actually had some errors or some diagnostics associated with that there might be warnings and or errors there's some basic things like did it actually have some errors and you can also some higher level services associated which with the untyped uh, tree which is things like can i actually set a breakpoint at that particular line so uh, when i clicked on this here that we're not actually debugging. We can't actually ask a debugger session, can we set that breakpoint? But it can look at the syntax and say, is that a valid line on which to set a breakpoint for the F sharp syntax? So, for instance, I can't set it on line 57. I can't set a breakpoint here because it is failing that call. So that's one of the one of the things that happens off the untyped tree. And the actual syntax tree itself is here. You could these you could do all of the things below just by processing the actual syntax tree directly. 
And um, there are a lot of people in the FL community who are very good at working with the untyped syntax tree. And in fact, a lot of the other services that you can see on this list are actually things which uh, do even more kind of um, analysis based on the untyped tree. So, uh, for example, if I've got this correct, we can look at surface structure. This thing here says get the outlining ranges for a, for a given parse input. That's to give us these operations down. That's to give us these ranges for these outlining and collapsing here. And this gives us the kind of various scopes that you can kind of collapse and open. And this gives us uh, information. I haven't actually looked at this uh, for a while. So, but I'll some I won't go through it. You can read the docs. Okay, so that's what an example uh, the service structure of some additional functionality which gives additional analysis of these untyped inputs. There's also, for, inst uh, for instance, uh, operations. Let's see, that's not off the past input. Let's take uh, see if there's anything assembly content. Uh, this also try does some um, these are various helpers associated with the untyped uh, untyped input. Getting long identifiers, find nearest point to insert open declaration and so on. Okay. Yeah, we've been through that. And uh, here's some more ones. There are things such as yeah, so similar, similar kind of uh, additional operations on the parse input that are typically needed in editors. Okay. Uh, some of this, there is some legacy here that we should go and clean out, and we're, we're, we're looking at doing an end-to-end -end clean on the F-Sharp Compiler Service API. For example, we, we, we looked at this service structure, which is used to get this outlining work here. There's actually a separate implementation of that called Service Navigation, which was done by Thomas Petrachek right back in the very first edition of, of the Visual F-Sharp tools. Uh, and was a hidden Easter egg feature that we didn't turn on in, in the very first edition of, uh, of the Visual F Sharp tools. Uh, so it's very likely that no one uses this at all anymore since that there's a um, more uh, better implementation for this for this structuring here. So we but we really have to check between um, FS autocomplete, uh, the the JetBrains tools and the um, the Visual F# -sharp tools, and then we can probably just delete or deprecate this one here. There are also some generic utilities to walk over the AST using a visitor kind of stru structure. This uh, lets you visit all match clause patterns, record fields, etc. Type type syntactic types and so on and you can traverse with a visitor here and then you can collect some state uh, as you go through the traversal process. Uh, that is fairly straightforward generic utility. Uh, okay, so that's covered this section here, okay. And it's also covered quite a lot of this editor IDE services, at least the part that's to do with the untyped tree. But of course, you also want to do slightly more accurate and semantically rich analysis. And so that's called working with the typed tree. And let's just take questions. Uh, it's a good place to pause. That will likely remain. OK, it's worth mentioning. So their own project system as well. So, OK. Uh, let's have a look here. That XML doc file writer has no XML comments, yes. <laughs> Scott, you have a pull request to submit before the end of the evening. That's your, uh, that, that's your assignment based on that comment. Uh, I was in that file. Oh, you, you're going to do it, Chet. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Uh, 
could you say something about the project system? Uh, it is so this folder for our use outside Visual Studio. You've wanted, I think that's been answered. We have created our own project system in Ionide. So the, people might be asking, what is a project system? And effectively, um, uh, I mean, project system is sort of the incremental editor and incremental sort of maintain maintenance over the FS proj file. Uh, so it's a visual a visual editor and the sort of increment incrementalization of all the edits you can do on that on that kind of through that visual editor and its uh, association with everything else in the IDE tooling that talks to to find out to listen into changes in that kind of in, in that in, in that state. Uh, and that there, there is one in Ionide. Uh, okay, it's fine. Let them trip around their own project system as well. Yes, Philip answers the question that is at Visual Studio only. Uh, and fine. Okay. Right. Okay, so if keep the questions flowing. Uh, Vlad, dive in anytime if you've got particular questions. On what we've covered so far. Let's have a pause for a moment. Any questions, Vlad? No, not yet. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the semantic analysis, and that is uh, in again through the F sharp checker object. So we really just covered this entry point. I skipped over uh, match braces here, this one here, but that's a fairly obvious. Uh, name what that does you get back a, a big array of pairs of ranges for where braces match in the f-sharp language and that is for instance when i click on this here there you can see the matching brace on this side there it actually just analyzes the entire file there's a um there's appropriate ca caching of the um of the results so it doesn't repeat work uh, too much uh, when things aren't changing and match match matching braces is just really very fast so we just do the whole lot and uh, rely on the FCS cache. There's been a as an aside there's been a bit of a tension in the F sharp uh, compiler service uh, sort of design about effectively is the F sharp compiler service actually an operating system? That is, is it responsible for looking after, for limiting resource usage, for example? You can you can do many of these calls in parallel, In uh, you can do multiple calls, active calls at the same time. Uh, and uh, for a long time, the F-Sharp compiler service had a queue of work, which it went through. It wasn't a priority queue, it was just a single, but essentially, it was a very, very weak priority queue. It had a queue of work to do, and it had an operation which it did if nobody was doing asking it anything. It had some background work that it was busy doing in little bits and pieces. So it was a very weak priority queue. Uh, the that has largely gone away, and where where kind of the philosophy is that the F sharp compiler service is not an operating system. Uh, it does keep some tables. It does keep some caches, and it and you can tune those sizes through various ways. You can flush them out. Uh, we also try not to, um, uh, we try to keep those as weak as possible and to make sure we don't keep too much stuff. But uh, in the end, the whoever is using this API is actually ultimately responsible for for resource usage of, uh, of the API. Uh, and so just be aware of that as that kind of thing. We're not your, it's not a service in the web sense of a service which has to do all of that management of resources on the server side. It, it's 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 not like that. It's a it's a it's a library, and you can muck things up. Yeah. Uh, so by you know caveat emptor on this sort of thing. Okay, so we can parse file. There's also an, a non-caching version of that, uh, and. You can okay, but you can not only parse the file, but you can actually check the file as well. So once you get your parse file results back from parse file, you can pipe them through into here in the checking the file, and then you give it some more source text. And crucially, you give it the F sharp project options as well, uh, which 
which weren't used in the which weren't there. And this actually gives the full context for the part for the actual checking. Parsing can be done without context in F sharp. You don't need to know really know which project you're in. You just need to know the hash defines and a couple of things, the conditional defines for uh, for, for for the parsing. Uh, but checking does need a bunch of options. And so there's this big fat record here, which gives you a whole lot of things like tells you what the project file name is, tells you it gives you an optional identifier, tells you what the source files in the project are. So the the file you're checking should be one of these source files in in and this is the files in the list in the order that they need to be checked. There may be other options. There may be some other referenced projects, and that is actually done by a recursive reference to the sort of the name of the DLL generated by those projects, the the the, the output, and then a recursive set of options. So you, the F# -sharp project options is really a graph of projects, uh, and so this actually for a very large solution of two hundred projects, where you're working in a project that references everything. This is actually quite a large object potentially. It's potentially it's so you, the creation of these and the incremental maintenance of these objects or of, of the, 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 the table of those is actually an important thing, but that's done on the caller side. The caller has to look after this graph of project options for a very large um, a large graph. Uh, there could be it might be we change how we do this at some point so we don't use this kind of recursive structure because it can be actually surprisingly easy to kind of muck that up and create things which are too sort of expensive uh, without quite realizing it. OK, and there are some other kind of things in the project options you can read through there. OK, uh, so we talked about F -sharp project options. Let's go back. Yeah. Oops. Uh, where were we? Matching braces, parsing the file. This one. So we had um, check file in project. You can actually do both of those in one step: parse and check file in project. Uh, file name, version, source text, text, and options. Just to say the source text comes in as an object rather than just as a string. This is important uh, if you're in a hosted situation in say, it's say Visual Studio, where you don't want to kind of copy the entire contents of a big file every time someone presses dot or you, every time you do a bit of work on the file. So this source text here lets you access into the contents of some external buffer using just sort of using line by line and uh, as long as the source text. So all of this work can be hosted in any situation where you have access, logically have access to F sharp uh, source code. OK, um, parsing. Uh, so you can ask for individual file in a project and you can ask for the results for the entire project here which will give you F sharp check project results. So this is the results of checking the entire project. So errors. And now here are some quite semantic things that are coming back as a result. So you're getting the sort of the signature of the entire, the entire inferred signature of the assembly. That is the result of that project. Uh, so this is everything that is externally vis vis visible. Uh, th so this is sort of the, it's like what you get when you do IL, IL DASM in a way. Uh, it's the logical context. If I just do IL DASM on a thing here and you start to see this structure that we get out, this is, well, it's, you know, the sort of, this is the, the, the .NET IL version of everything, but it's the F sharp equivalent. Uh, uh, an object which represents all of this information uh, from the F-sharp equivalent of that. You can also ask for its actual contents, as in the actual implementations of things. Uh, in order to get that, you have to have set uh, this thing here. Uh, uh, keep assembly contents there. Uh, otherwise, contents. So. 
you, you'll ask for assembly contents if, for instance, you're actually going to analyze implementations for using some fancy semantic analysis, or uh, you're doing F sharp lint kind of things, or if you're going to interpret uh, the contents using an interpreter, uh, or do something with the actual expressions in the actual F sharp source code. Tells you a bit about the context where you are. And now you can actually ask to get accurate information about things like symbol uses. You can get all uses of all symbols everywhere in the entire solution in the entire project, which will come back with a big array of F sharp symbol uses. You can get uses of a particular symbol and get a list there. Uh, okay. Um, right. Now that gets us onto the question of symbols. Uh, which is a, uh, a another major chunk of this. So how do you actually get a symbol? Well, um, let's just see how we get symbol uses. There's one more way to get, we'll, we'll do this one, get symbol use at location. So if your cursor is say at a particular location like that one, then it will, the, the, the editing tools using this component are first going to ask, well, give a line, given a column, the end of the name, so that column there, uh, and, and it, for various better or worse, it, it is, uh, you have to re-give the text of the entire line that you're on, which will be all of that text, and then it'll tell you, give you back a, a symbol use, an, an, an object saying, hey, there's actually a symbol being used at this particular location. And a symbol use, contains a symbol here and it contains some other things about its uh, uh, the the kind of use that the thing is uh, gives you some ranges tells you is the thing already private to the file uh, and and so on and then it gives you a symbol uh, that is at that location and all the editing that we're seeing is actually based on that. So you can see the logic, it says, what symbol have we got? And then you get all the uses of that symbol, which is how we're doing that highlighting here. So you get all the uses of that symbol in a particular file or in a particular assembly. Right, so we have a symbol and we can come through and we can look at what a symbol is. And a symbol uses an object model. Uh, this is so we can make a binary compatible version of this, really, is the main thing uh, as we develop it over time. And a symbol is one of these things. It's either an entity, which is either a type definition or a module. So uh, here in the inherits of sharp symbol. Or, and you can access lots of information about entities. For example, you can ask what are all the interfaces declared on, declared on that thing. It's a lot like a system.type. Doesn't use exactly the same naming as a system.type, but uh, you can see it might have a base type. You can see it's members or values, members, func sorry, members functions and values. Uh, so sort of most of its contents, you can see what fields it has. You can see whether it's an F sharp type abbreviation and if it's a union type, it's union cases. So you can see a lot of information about the about an actual uh, entity. And the other big thing in here is the one we just mentioned, which is an F sharp member or functional value here, and represents an F sharp method, a property event, functional value. Uh, and it is just, just one thing and corresponds to a val inside the F sharp compiler, really. And you can see you can get a lot of different information about this thing, logical name, displayed name, what are its parameters if it's a method, uh, what is its return parameter information, what are the custom attributes on it, uh, and so on. You can run through all the different things, but it's pretty much everything you'd expect uh, from working with .NET Reflection, plus extra information to do with F Sharp, the F Sharp kind of view of the programming language, of the language. Okay, uh, so that is a symbol. Okay, uh, so that explains these parts up here, symbol FSI and symbol.fs. And there are some, uh, a bunch of help, helper patterns to do with working with symbols for pattern matcher and different kind of aspects of a, uh, a symbol here. They all need to be documented. 
And if you're looking at the assembly contents here, the F-sharp assembly contents, then you, uh, you will see the actual implementations of right throughout an assembly. So for instance, you might see when you look at an assembly, it has a bunch of files implementing that assembly, the .fs files. So these are the implementation files. And for each of those, you can look at the for here. You can look at the declarations in each in every file. You can check some other things like is that file a script? Is it the entry point? And also what are its declarations? And each declaration is either the declaration of an entity such as this, or it's the declaration of a member of function or value associated with inside an entity. Or it's actually just an init action. It's just a thing that gets run when the, that file gets uh, gets triggered for initialization. And in each of these, you have, uh, like for instance, a member says, here's the thing being declared, here are the arguments, and here's an expression, which is the actual implementation of that member. And in an expression here, you, uh, you have a whole bunch of uh, expression is one of these cases of this active pattern that might be a call expression and so on down the line. Right, so let's run back to our guiding list and see what we've got through. We've talked about uh, checking documents. We've talked about getting symbols from documents. There's, it's here working with symbols. We've talked about looking at signatures and of a, an assembly. And we've, we've just started to look at working with resolved expressions. You've also seen a little bit about working with projects. Uh, so you can request a check of an entire project by giving the entire set of arguments for checking that. And you can also ask for a graph, a project within a graph of related projects uh, in a solution inside the, in the Visual Studio terminology. OK, uh, so there's some things on the available that we've skipped over to do with autocomplete and tooltips. Uh, they're fairly well documented. We'll just run through one example of that in um, editor.fsx. And let's take a look at this here. We've just loaded this up. We'll open that to create a new checker and use that checker. Here's some input to the checker. And we'll take the lines, we'll split the lines out. We will get, okay, we're treating this as a script. We get in parsing options for that. We parse the file. We're going to check the file here. And oh, we can do it in one step here. It just shows that. And let's check that that succeeded and extract the results. And then we start to use those. So one of the things on the checker, on the check file results. So when you check a file, you get back this uh, F sharp check file results. And it's got a whole range of services that you can say, hey, I checked the file. Let's look at uh, some of them we've seen before, get all uses of all symbols in file, get me a declaration list, get me the methods available at a particular point. Give me some tooltip text uh, and uh, get use of a particular symbol in a, in, a, in this particular file. Uh, so in this case, we're going to get some tooltip text at a particular location. And as I said, you have to give the line again, which is shouldn't really be needed, but it is. And you also have to give this foo again. We're trying to get in our input back up here. We're trying to get the tooltip text that would apply when we hovered over this foo. Now, you don't have to use this API to get tooltip text. In fact, Ionide actually re-implements nearly all its own tooltip text. You can simply get the symbol for foo and look at all the information on the symbol for foo and then go and make your own tooltip text. And so uh, that that's great, you know. Uh, uh, it's it, there's enough information available to do. You don't have to be tied to these to these kind of sim simple entry points here. So we did get some tooltip text here. You can see that the tooltip text is here, telling you the type of foo, and it tells you some other things like uh, is, is there any XML doc to add, 
and uh, and so on, and some other remarks to be added. Okay, um, and there's other things such as the declaration lists for autocomplete. So what are the declarations to show at a dot position like this? And it's this kind of similar kind of process, uh, and you can print the, the declaration list available at a particular point in the file. And similarly, you can get the methods, and the, the get methods applies particularly when you hit a, 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 a bracket like this, and you get a list of methods available. So, or if you do system.console.writeline here, and you press bracket here, then you get a list of all the methods, all the method overloads that are available at that point. Okay, so it's using get methods here. And uh, again, you could do that uh, based on the symbol information uh, to, 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 to do some of that yourself. Okay. Right, so that is running through these editor services, autocomplete, tooltips, parameter information, and so on. We didn't look at parameter information. I mentioned some of the aspects of that, uh, but there's more. There's another entry point for that. Uh, OK, so the last part, we've kind of done all of this uh, with the exception that uh, in, you know, there are some things I mentioned down here about structure and uh, some other things you can take a look at about getting name suggestions when there are errors. Uh, and uh, you can you can take a look through the parts that I've missed through those, but there are, I've covered nearly everything, I think. Okay. So uh, that leaves us with this last part down here, which is the interactive session. And it really comes down to this object here, represent the FSI evaluation session. And this is really the implementation of F Sharp Interactive. It's the core object that is being not, it's not hosted, but we are actually running an FSI.exe process in this, in, in this window, associated with this window down here. But that process is really running one FSI evaluation session object. And when you create one of these things, uh, you can, well, you can ask for a few things. You can actually ask the interactive session for its completions at a point. You can evaluate interactions. So you send it some code with a can, an active cancellation token. There's a couple of entry points for that. You can actually, slight differences to evaluate an interaction, which is to evaluate something like one plus one, like this. Uh, compared to evaluating an entire script, uh, which is a, a different, a slightly different operation. And you can actually just evaluate an expression and actually ask if I evaluated this expression, what actual object would I get back? So you get a kind of reflective view of uh, a particular, the results of a particular expression. So for instance, you can use this, use this object to create uh, you can put in appropriate arguments for references or evaluate some hash R NuGet pa package references. And then you can use that object as a calculator by just continually calling a val expression on that object uh, for different chunks of code. Uh, and voila, you've got yourself a, 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 a fancy fat calculator. Uh, and you can um, check, okay, given, given a context here, you can do some of the things we mentioned before. You can parse and check interactions. That would be, for instance, to give colorization on interactions before they are entered in a notebook, uh, before they're executed. Uh, you, can, you can give red squigglies on a, for a cell before they're available, you know, but before anything is actually executed, but in the context of the interactive object. Uh, the interactive session object. Uh, there are some events you can listen to so that every time an event, every time a let is executed in that session, you can kind of look, you know, kind of update something in your in your in your calculator interface. Uh, you can try and get all the actual objects that are bound uh, in the session. 
And um, that is it. You can also associate this with a standard in and a standard out so that it actually just sits there reading information from a standard in. If interacting, start the background thread to read the standard input. And that is that is kind of the whole thing. You can, if you really want, you can actually get the dynamically generated assembly that's running along. Uh, and you can also look at the sort of partially the partial assembly signature. So what have we, you know, what have we defined so far? All the modules, all the all the types that are defined, uh, one of those objects we were looking at before. And it's got an associated checker, which is used for some of these operations up above to check interactions and so on. And you can get access to that to do any of the editing services uh, in that evaluation context. <coughs> so um, that is that. OK, so cool. Now, um, To mention the F-Sharp compiler service component is available as a Fable component. Now, I haven't checked on the status of that, uh, but it is used in the Fable REPL. Yeah, if I remember rightly. So this is actually compiling, if I've got it rightly, all of that code to JavaScript and hosting the compiler in the browser. Uh, so, although that seems like uh, it's, it's quite a staggering thing to me to think that all of this, as far as I understand it, it might be, a, I think it's the case, all of this code actually compiles through Fable and to JavaScript and runs and like, runs in the browser. Uh, and I haven't used this in a while, so I've got some samples here. Uh, Okay, run. Do we need to run this? Yeah, there we go. Sorry, I don't. I don't. All right. Have a look at the code here. So this is actually hosting the compiler as a JavaScript component in the browser, using it to uh, do some of this editing uh, and analysis. Uh, I'm, uh, it's probably using a Monaco web editor here. Uh, so I'm not sure how much it's exactly where it's getting its F-sharp analysis from. Let's just see if it's, is it actually doing right? Yep, it is. So it's doing compilation analysis as I type. Uh, and that is no server-side component involved in this. This is just purely JavaScript analyzing F-sharp code. The, the way the F-sharp compiler service component this package does not include that support. Uh, to find that, Chet, could you... Is it still maintained out of the Fable? Yeah, they have a, uh, I think, a Git submodule or equivalent for FCS. I see. So it used I, to be. I think it's off of .NET F Sharp still. It, it's it, just patches. I see. I see. It used to be done here. So so if they if we go to Fable, uh, up. We'll come here, then probably somewhere in here they have. Uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll leave, we'll leave that. It's under the main Fable repository. There's okay. a subdirectory lib slash FCS, and uh, they okay. they actually package binary built versions of FCS. And if you scroll down, there's a link to Encaves. Uh, I see. Work of .NET F -sharp. I, I I see, and 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 this in, this includes the Fable compiler. Uh, this include this is sort of the JavaScript compiled version of this, or is it correct? Yeah. This okay. is in case changes to FCS to yeah. enable all their stuff. Got it. Okay. Uh, right. So this is the JavaScript. So you can actually look at the difference between. It's probably on one of these branches here. Yes, it's probably on one of these branches here, maybe. So it's, if this is right, four commits ahead, 362 commits behind. So there's actually this is a relatively small diff to the uh, to the F sharp compiler to allow it to compile its JavaScript. Okay. Right. 
Uh, okay. So the whole thing compiles JavaScript as well. Uh, we, so we haven't reached kind of the unification point between Fable and .NET F Sharp, uh, which I think is good. It's allowing Fable to be very creative in what they're doing and uh, yeah, not tying up JavaScript engineering with .NET engineering. Uh, so that would be a, that would be probably a step too far. But if you are interested in that comp component, then sort of be act, watch this repo. In fact, I will watch it here and get involved in. Um, in fact, this is the, if I understand correctly, this is the pull request, yes, from Fable to main, which represents the diff for adding Fable support into FCS. Okay, so you can take a look. It is, I said it was a small diff. It's not a small diff, it's a fairly large diff. But you can take a look at what was needed to be done what, uh, to, to get it to compile as a Fable component. Okay, so there are some shims, for example, for things like this, for to make sure everything is available in the, in the Fable ecosystem, some shims for system.io and, and so on. Okay, so yes, encourage you to get involved in NK slash F sharp and in fact the whole Fable uh, side of the compiler engineering because it's kind of obvious that having the F sharp analysis and everything else available in the JavaScript ecosystem, it's just a very powerful thing in the in the long run. Okay, I'll just check for questions on that. Uh, system text JSON is BCL now. Yes, but that's a question of whether it would be in Fable or not, uh, I think. is So those shims are for, to make sure they're available as JavaScript compiled uh, components. Oh no, I see this was a different discussion, I see, sorry. I was not reading the context correctly. Phil has been uh, answering the questions as we go, I think. Have I missed any? Let's take a look. Let's take a look, project system. Uh, Okay. Source generators, yes, it's a good question. Philip's kind of answered that, I think. Okay, well, Philip's, Philip's done, done the job, thanks. Uh, okay, so let's go back to our guide. We've Ah, so we've, we've talked about hosting F Sharp Interactive. There's just a couple more things we can talk about. One is hosting the compiler itself. And that, for example, so at the moment we've done analysis and we've done interactive execution. Uh, and, but one of the things you can do in the F sharp checker object is to actually compile things as well, which is here. So you, and this literally, you create an F sharp checker object and you call compile with a whole bunch of command line arguments, and you've got yourself an F sharp compiler from that. Uh, and it, uh, you get some diagnostics back and a return code, and that is. That is it. And you can keep calling compile as many times as you like. Those compilations are essentially independent. Uh, that they may, it's not guaranteed to be perfect if you host again and again in the same process, in the sense you might get slightly different numbers uh, coming through uh, in, in generated identifiers. But basically, you can keep doing compilation again and again, and there won't be any particular accumulation of resources. So you can have a hosted compiler service of some kind. There's also an entry point which isn't really used. Uh, we might have talked about this. I think Eric um, Sapalas mentioned one place where it was being used. I've forgotten that one. But where you can actually give it a syntax tree that you've generated yourself or you've manipulated yourself uh, and do a compile on that. So that is permitted. And you can also compile reflectively to a dynamic assembly uh, using reflection emit. Uh, and there's two, there's two entry points, two corresponding entry points for that here. 
Uh, and you can optionally interactively execute. So this is sort of a bit misnamed. It's not only compiled to dynamic assembly, it's like compile and optionally execute uh, as if it was like a script or, you know, uh, and um, that's all very, all fine. You get diagnostics back and the assembly might come back if you've all has gone well. Okay. Uh, so that is compilation. Now we actually use this, in, the, use these things in testing. So if you uh, uh, if you look at our test suites, then um, oops, here we go. then you'll actually see many calls to this particular operation for instead of just continually reinvoking the command line compiler, which obviously has costs associated with that. Uh, we just re-invoke this many times and it's much, much faster for doing F-sharp uh, testing. Uh, okay, and Vlad has been working on using this a lot uh, for, for in, in our test suites. Okay, cool. So we're close to getting through, which is great. Uh, and the last thing, there are some um, uh, sort of hacks in the compiler. Uh, where you can actually set a global variable in the DLL, which represents the file system for the component. It's a full-on global, and it is, where is it? It is, uh, file system.fsi. It is under f -sharp compiler source code services dot uh, if you dot file system auto opens dot file system, and so you can just once you open the namespace, you can just set the file system, and uh, you have to set it to be an implementation of this object, and that means whenever the compiler was trying to talk to the file system, then it, uh, it will instead use this object to read things from disk and so on. Now, I'm not going to say this is done perfectly. I do know, I think that this is used in FS autocomplete. I think it's used in uh, the uh, INR, used in Rider, uh, but we don't have anything in our checking that we don't actually make direct file system calls and we should actually do a, a scrub to check that we're not actually, for instance, calling file.delete anywhere. We're always going through this shim. I, I've got a suspicion some recently some things have crept in which maybe aren't going through this file system shim. Uh, for instance, in the hash our nougat implementation, we may it's possible we're not going through the shim anymore. And so keep an eye out for that. The F# -sharp compiler, the Visual Studio tools don't use this hook. It's a it's a hook for the community, uh, and so it's important that the community keep us honest with regard to that. And also, we should add, perhaps add some tests that there are no direct calls to the file system elsewhere in the compiler, at least on a syntactic basis or some analysis. Okay, so that's the file system hook. There is another hook which the JetBrains writer people use that is in the in the reader for assemblies and that's because they want to be able to kind of in, at the moment the compiler is set up to read everything from disk and to read assemblies in other projects from disk and that means if you haven't opened the pro if you haven't compiled the project then you won't get any, and it references, say, a C-sharp project, and you won't get any analysis because that reference isn't, isn't present, even if all the source code is available. But in theory, you could have, in, say, Rider, you can have that C-sharp project can tell you everything about that assembly, even before it's compiled anything. It's just an analyzed it, and it can access that sort of that logical contents of another project through a hook in the IL reader, if I, I think that's correct. Uh, and that is this assembly reader hook here. It's another shim here, public hook for changing the IL assembly reader used by actually JetBrains writer. And um, so 
I don't encourage really anybody else to use that hook at this point because it's an advanced hook used in a in a powerful IDE. Okay. So that is these hooks setting these variables. You can host a compiler in situations where a file system is not available or you want to change the logical nature of the file system. And that is that is pretty much everything in the F sharp compiler service uh, component. I'm just going to show you the tests here. There are plenty of other tests that use the F sharp compiler service as well. These are the things, this is the place I've opened F sharp compiler service dot solution. This is the place for things which sort of explicitly service service oriented. For instance, things checking that hook, for example, uh, where I, I provide an implementation of our file system called my file system and then we check things like a file system compilation test where we uh, access um, I don't know we, we set up a file system and we check we can compile against it and other aspects of what I've sort of talked about today I say I talked about a tree visitor so you can create a visitor and you can do some visiting and you can create a tokenizer and so pretty much everything I've talked about today you should have a corresponding test section just running through those different parts of, of, the, of the testing. Um, yeah. Right. Questions. Okay. Memory mapped file stuff doesn't use as though. Uh, okay. So, yeah, Vlad is cool, cool. doing some engineering on this part here. That's great. Right. Um, okay. Now, Chet, keep me honest. Vlad, keep me honest. What have we missed? Philip, you've been you've been working on large parts of this as well. Uh, what have we missed? People want to ask questions. Open discussion. Um, um, I, I, I guess I'll mention the question. A lot of cleanup has gone into this. We've just done a huge trim of the surface area. Uh, Yep. While you're thinking of questions, I'll just show the surface area test here. So this big uh, big file is about 10,000 lines long, and it shows the sort of reflection view of the surface area to the to the to the DLL. And you can see here now it's actually been nearly all of it's this syntax tree thing here, and then you can see the stuff I've been running through today, sharp tokens. For lexing, a sharp navigation, glyphs, source code services, uh, symbols that were there somewhere, and then the abstract IL shim for the JetBrains hook that I mentioned. Do you see the whole thing that is public? This is the public service area, the DLL. Uh, and we've cut this in half. So the next edition of F sharp compiler service will contain half the amount of stuff. It went down from 25,000 down to 10,000. So we got we hid quite a lot of stuff, but we're, we've been talking with various stakeholders and we're pretty sure that everything that is available is that people are actually using is still there. Uh, we're doing that because we want to put this component on a much better engineering basis and we're still to decide if we're going to move to this being a binary compatible component or not. Uh, and what are the ramifications for that for F-sharp engineering? Do we have to do more engineering on hiding things in the API? It's a, this is a major. If we if we manage to get this to be a binary compatible component, we can do all sorts of great things like analyzers, which are per, which are a, you know permanently trustworthy part of the ecosystem. We can do. Um, oh, I guess that's the main thing we can do. We can do analyzers, F sharp analyzers. Okay, questions, Philip. What have I forgotten? Um, one thing that I think would be helpful is uh, so FCS is not an easy API to work with at all. Yep. Um, there's a lot of code that you have to write to sort of set up things so that you can start, you know, doing things like inspecting symbols. I think it would be helpful to walk through uh, one of those in the Visual Studio tooling um, just to show how that actually gets done because so like a given editor yeah. um whether whether it comes from lsp or if it comes from visual studio i'm at you know jetbrains has some similar 
abstractions as well. Um, you're given a document you're, and you're given usually some kind of thing about that document, oftentimes a position of where the carrot is in that document. Yeah. And you need to somehow take that information and turn it into what FCS is going to accept and yeah. Um, yep. then get the data back from FCS and then massage it so that it, it works out there. I think it'd yep. probably be helpful to go through one of those and then maybe yep. check if you're up through it, doing a small walkthrough of how that how that works in FS Autocomplete as well through the lens of how, you know, a, an LSP response uh, kind of yep. gets created. Yeah, there's, yeah, and there's kind of two aspects of that. One is um, if you look at at a certain level, it's easy. Uh, in a sense, I've shown these kind of examples of like getting tooltip text and you can kind of, it's, it's not a lot of code, but these magic things like giving this thing and this thing here are actually really painful to go back and get those from the actual source code. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is getting it uh, from the editing context, so from the Visual Studio context, so getting the project options uh, from the project context, getting, uh, you know, that that is that is really quite a lot of work involved in that as well so let me i have opened up visual f sharp here which is contains all the visual studio uh, implementation as well and so uh f sharp editor is the component that kind of uses uh f sharp um it uses the f sharp compiler service uh, so this is what Philip was asking me to. It actually used F# -sharp compiler private, which is almost identical to F# -sharp compiler service these days. We're very close to being able to get rid of F# -sharp compiler private and just replace it with F# -sharp compiler service, and that should happen sometime soon. We hope. Uh, and now let's just take a look at one thing, like um, I don't know. Uh, Maybe a code fix. Uh, so um, I think a good potential one would be um, make declaration mutable. That that one will walk through several several things. Okay. This is a um, let me think here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice wall of text here, Philip. Yeah, so this thing, we haven't yet got IDE supporting this. Uh, we, all right, let's take a look at this. So, so where this is uh, adding a uh, da, 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 code fix provider into the mix of things available in the Visual Studio editor. Uh, it is, what, what's it actually implementing? Make declaration mutable, what does it actually do, Philip? Uh, so at a high level, what this thing does is, so this triggers off of a diagnostic, um, yeah. FS0027. Um, yeah. And so uh, basically, yeah, that, that'll happen if you're trying to make something mutable when it's not right. actually so, mutable. So, so that's so, a compiler. So, so. So this and is so what, what Roslyn does for okay. us in this case yeah. is uh, we have a separate diagnostics engine that throws diagnostics at the um, yep. at Visual Studio, and then it yields it back to us, and it gives us some additional context, including the error code, um, the it. span of text within a document that corresponds to that uh, diagnostic. And yep. so that's how we're able to sort of key off of that information and then turn it into a code fix by analyzing the source code uh, based off of that. Yep. Got it. Okay, so we filter the diagnostics coming in, and we check whether we're actually. I mean, this this is not the fastest way to do this stuff. We check whether we filter for the, the diagnostics to be equal to FS twenty seven, the ID, and if it is, then well, we've collected up a uh, array of di diagnostics, and we're in this lovely um, computation expression, which allows us to to start doing a whole bunch of things, and they might fail along the way, in which case. Uh, the operation will say, hey, nothing, can't, no chops, can't do anything. Uh, and so we check we're not in a signature file. And now here's where we kind of have to start. We want to get try and get options for editing a document or project. Uh, so this is the 
Okay, now this is the document. Okay, and it is yep, fine. Uh, and we get back now. We're starting to see some of the objects that we were familiar with. This is on the use side of F# -sharp compiler service. So we're starting to see that we've got ourselves a F# -sharp parsing options and F# -sharp project options in the compiler service API. We grab the text asynchronously for the document. Uh, this is actually getting a source text object here, and then we get the line get line from position yes yeah, so this is the stuff you were talking about philip that you have to get the text line the text line position you have to be very careful to convert from two uh zero base to one base line counts and then you parse and check the document using actually the checker that's fine uh the, and now this will be very so there are so f f i said f sharp compiler service isn't an operating system that's not entirely true it does keep some caches for you and one of them is a cache of the uh parse and of the parse and check documentation so if the file hasn't changed and the project options are just as before with the same stamp and everything then this will be immediate and then it says give me the symbol at a position at the position where this error happened so i was giving that example here so it says the error happened at this position give me the symbol x then it says get me the declaration location of that uh, which will be this declaration here and it says if i found it and it's in the same file then uh, get me the span of this thing here, the declaration range. Check that you're not in a parameter position because you can't go whacking mutable in a parameter position in F sharp. And it says starts to fix up the code fix so that when you hover, you'll get this lovely code fix. Make declaration mutable and it's and says the change will be made. So it makes that thing, which is the actual code fix object, goes to code fix helper, create a change code fix. It says basically returning the insertion, inserted code by the look of it, by changing the, a zero position actually and inserting mutable. And you say, hey, we've got a code fix and we're done. And that is that. So that's cool. I mean, obviously, if you're going to write a new code fix, you can see lots of examples of doing it down here. Um, wonderful additions to, to, to the tools. And you can just run through and bang, just copy out these examples and add them into the visual shop tools. And they're also similar things available in Rider, and if obviously if there's a lot of shared implementation you could in theory share a, a lot of this or copy it out from one project to another yeah there's there's a decent amount of sharing between um vs code and vs or i guess i should say fs autocomplete and vs in terms of how things are done now there's some quirks because the information that LSP gives you is different than the information that a Roslyn workspace host gives you. Got it. Um, and then Rider is actually entirely different, uh, where they, they have um, a system that that sort of parses out, um, uh, I guess you call it tokens. I don't know quite the, the right terminology, basically into a resharper model. And then mm -hmm. uh, they have a custom set of APIs for interacting with resharper nodes that is entirely different from all of this. Okay, um, got it. Okay. And so that, that that's probably where, uh, if you were to learn how to do it this way, it probably wouldn't be the most helpful in terms of contributing to Writer. Because okay. They do stuff very differently, but they also have plenty of code fixes that you could look at as an example. Yeah, lot, lots of examples um, in the code base. Yeah. Well, great, one, great. one one additional note is this tokenizer dot get symbol at position is actually specific to the Visual Studio tools and is not portable right now. I took uh -huh. a hand at trying to port it into FCS and it's actually really hard uh, because this is an extremely involved routine um, that yeah, that gets uh, a bunch of uh, data both. Uh, data from the lexer and data from classification and mm -hmm. it will then um, 
build up stuff very efficiently. Basically, it's like saying, hey, how do I get a symbol for something without actually having the symbol for it? Uh, so we call a, a lexer symbol. Um, and that's necessary for interacting with some APIs. However, other APIs don't actually require this, which is yeah. where it gets a little tricky. Got it. Uh, just to say, to, to give an idea for how far the drilling has come, when, when I was doing some cleanup work recently associated with that FCS API cleanup, I was able to successfully do find a uh, sort of solution wide rename, at least an F sharp compiler service solution over the entire compiler code base, which is the largest F sharp single F sharp component uh, in I think that exists probably. And uh, it, it it accurately renamed. I think there was maybe a couple of glitches, uh, but uh, it essentially it, it it was a trustworthy rename of of things across a huge code base, and you know it's good. It's 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 you know things things are uh, coping with very it, the the performance improvements in the F sharp tooling have been really quite wonderful in the last year, uh, and yep. Okay, just to say lots of positive things going on there. Okay, yeah, Phil, that was really, really useful to walk through. Chet, were, were you got, want to run through something on the FS Autocomplete? In fact, you can tell us. Sure. Do you want to just tell everybody a bit about how FS Autocomplete, uh, first of all, what it actually is, and also how it fits, you know, how, yep. how it does everything? So, uh... FS Autocomplete is a language server you, protocol. You, 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 can, you can share your screen, Chet, if you want. Oh, and, I can. And, and, yep, I'll, I'll awesome. turn mine off. Yep. All right. So you all should be able to see a VS Code text editor right now. Um, yep. And what we are in is FS Autocomplete itself. Could, could you show us the GitHub repos just so people know where to watch? And, yes, absolutely. Yep. Um, Com. Let me change my sharing. Uh, I didn't share my whole screen because it's wide and I don't know what folks' uh, uh, viewing situations are like. But here's the F Sharp autocomplete repo. It lives under the F Sharp organization in GitHub. And uh, myself and Christoph Schislak, which I'm sure I just butchered and he'll call me out on it later. And a couple other folks help maintain this, and it's under active development. Um, we have a whole bunch of open pull requests, making the tooling stable, featureful, adding fun things before Visual Studio team to poke them. Um, so what this is, is a backend component that implements the language server protocol, which is uh, an open protocol that different languages can implement to provide a sort of common layer of functionality, regardless of the front end editor that you use. And there's documentation here about its purpose and how it works, but this diagram is the one they always show to show the benefit of it. Um, so if you think back five years or so, you had VS proper, you have VS for Mac, you have Sublime Text, you have Writer, you have uh, what else? Heck, even Notepad as an example, right? These are all different editors. Vim. And each one had Vim. There you go. Vim and Emacs and Atom all had bespoke implementations of language services for all these different languages. So if you wanted to have a rich F sharp editing experience, you had to know someone who had authored that functionality for that editor or be uh, filled with enough desire to make that editor plug in yourself. Language server protocol is an attempt to sort of standardize a way that clients can interact with servers so that one implementation of the language server can be done for a language and many editors can consume that. And so far, I would say it's been a roaring success. Uh, and FSAC is an implementation of that for F sharp. There are at, there is at least one other that I'm aware of, but in my opinion, FSAC is the sort of longest and most stable version of it. It actually didn't start out as LSP. It started as a uh, standard in, standard out protocol. Um, but when LSP sort of became the accepted winner, we transitioned fully over to that. Uh, it is not the only part of Ionide and VS Code. 
There's also the Ionite extension itself, which is a lightweight um, Fable JavaScript uh, plugin that does things that the language server protocol itself does not have as part of the protocol. Uh, an example of this is semantic highlighting, which is uh, highlighting of text in ranges based on something that's slightly more intelligent than just regexes. Um, so for for custom extensions to the language server protocol like that, that's all implemented inside Ionide. Another good example is like file edition. Everything in this right click over here is not something that's part of the language server protocol. That's something that's in the Ionide layer itself. Um, so what I wanted to show in FS Autocomplete was that same diagnostic or that it's called diagnostics in VS Code and in the language server protocol but it's that same code fix that Don just shot, showed you. Um, so to sort of illustrate it, if we go let x equals four, and then say, hey, wait, I want to, sorry, yeah. to, sorry to interrupt you. Um, oh, I'm not oh, showing uh, episode complete anymore, yeah, am I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm just going to say team, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all right, here we are. We are back in the code itself. And, so just like you saw, we have an error, we have a little bubble, we can click it and it will change the declaration. So same behavior. And this is our amount of code to do the same exact task. You should notice a couple similarities here. At a broad level, we're checking to make sure that the error that's returned is one of a certain set. We are extracting out positions from the context it's given us and it's important to note that like don mentioned this can be a very tricky process the f sharp compiler has a concept of a range of text and a start and end position but those are uh, numbered either from zero or from one depending on what particular structure you're looking at and the language server protocol or visual studios code fix context might have different opinions about what those counts mean and so for us, it's been a very picky, precise operation to get these positions uh, translated correctly. So then just like in Visual Studio, we'll get parse results for the file. Uh, we will get the project options for the file, just like in Visual Studio. And we'll also do something similar to that tokenizer that Philip was talking about to try and retrieve the symbol, get out of there, to try and retrieve the symbol at a particular position in a line of text. So given that, if we can find the symbol, we'll try and find the declaration of that symbol. And if we can find it, then we'll do that same check, like the same exact logic that Philip showed or that Don showed in Philip's implementation. And if we successfully find the location of the thing that we need to make mutable, then we will return our own structure describing where we need to start and end to input the text that we need to input. So overall, the it should look very similar. You should have a, a feeling of deja vu here. Um, and really the core logic here, this is what uh, this is what Philip would really contribute to making this easy to port. So he finds this logic in the first place, and I can take that same exact logic and mimic it here to get the same result in every situation. So it's very easy to make sure that the editors are in line with this sort of code fix, thanks to uh, the fact that we do all share the same F -sharp compi compiler service sources. So that's basically it. There's a little bit of additional registration code that I'm not showing here because it's not relevant, but the core steps for each of these should look very similar. Wonderful. Yeah. OK, that's great. Um, OK, questions. Um, are there plans for unifying Visual Studio, Ionide, uh, and FS Auto slash FS Auto Complete Worlds? So, uh, right, this, uh, uh, right, so the, I I can somewhat answer that. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of a somewhat answer. So like 
it's pretty obvious that the long-term trajectory of language services, at least within Microsoft editor tooling, is LSP. Um, and in fact, there are efforts right now to figure out a way to get C Sharp to use LSP within Visual Studio. And as a consequence of that, there's a lot of changes that are probably going to have to happen to the LSP protocol to be able to actually support uh, various IDE features that you know Visual Studio with Roslyn Workspaces supports, but LSP today doesn't. Um, and so as that work happens and LSP evolves, you know, eventually it's going to be able to support all the endpoints that F sharp tooling in Visual Studio has. And so we would we would use an LSP implementation rather than Roslyn workspaces. Um, we the, the problem is we don't know when that is or like how much what the what that quantity of work actually is and to be perfectly honest, it's going a lot slower than we thought it would uh, this time last year because because we were kind of thinking about what what a unification work would look like last year. Um, so there's also another angle to this, which is FS Autocomplete implements several things that one could argue actually belong in the FCS layer. Uh, and so then there's this sort of question of it's kind of like a philosophical question of, you know, t given FS Autocomplete and fsharp.editor and the unique things that they do, how many of those things should stay there or how many of those things should actually be moved, pushed down into a common layer? Um, because the more stuff that's pushed down to a common layer, the, obviously the easier it is to, to unify any kind of tooling experiences, regardless of if LSP is involved. Um, and so I, we kind of want to start, I think, with that discussion um, with uh, several folks who are stakeholders in this to sort of identify like you know hey what, what which one like out of out of the set of things that you own today um how many of these should be just uh a utility for everybody um versus how many really kind of only belong in your your editing environment um and then try to make progress on that uh while lsp sort of moves along um and then at, at that point um, like I would personally like to just incorporate the uh, FS Autocomplete LSP and just use that everywhere and use that as the single implementation. And, you know, we just party on that thing and increase quality if it needs increased quality, add new extensions if it needs extensions, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's a rather, f it's too far ahead in the future for, for us to, um, Really, get concrete about it, which is why I think the, the the discussion about what belongs in FCS is is kind of more tangible at this point. Because I definitely agree with the question. You know, duplicating efforts. You know, as as Chet said, there's ways to make it pretty easy. But you know, when when you have copy paste code sitting in two different things, eventually they're going to find a way to diverge, unless you're like really really on top of you know keeping that stuff up to date, which is just hard to do. So, um, anyways, that's my spiel. Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, so, or any more questions from uh, or discussion points that anyone would like to raise? Uh, then, I guess we've gone on a bit over an hour and a half. We can probably call it call it for today. So thanks everyone for coming. It's been a great kickoff for the year. Uh, wonderful to have something uh, like a community event like this to start. So thanks very much, Vlad, for putting front loading this.